Welcome. If you are joining us for the very first time, it's great to have you join us. And we trust that it's the first of many. Welcome back. If you're part of the church family, uh, as we just continue with part four of this series, More Than Just a Decision. Now, in this series, we're trying to draw that connection between asking really good questions and making better decisions. And it's in this series that we're really trying to drive home the point that if we are willing to ask ourselves a couple of good questions, then answer those questions honestly, and then act on those answers courageously, that it'll lead to a life of better decisions and far fewer regrets. You see, the truth is we aren't the only ones that are impacted by our decisions, are we? It's the people closest to us. It's our loved ones. It's the people that care for us the most, that we care for the most, that are ultimately as affected by our decisions as what we are. And that's really what we're trying to just unravel through this series. As a result, we we asked you... in week one, to memorize a saying of King Solomon, uh, just a, a, a scripture with us, uh, which is, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple, they keep going and pay the penalty. And this scripture is really there to just kind of act as that, as that trigger, just to, to act as that that, that thing that, that, that confronts that inner salesperson inside your head and inside my head that wants to sell us on all kinds of bad decisions. And it's this scripture, as we memorize it, as we, it comes back to memory in those moments, where it just makes us stop and ask some really good questions in the moment. And these questions will ultimately just help us slow down to be able to see that danger coming and act accordingly. So the first question that we asked was the integrity question. And that is, am I being honest with myself really? Like, am I really honest about my motives here? Am I really honest about why I want to do this? I might not be able to be honest with anyone else regarding this, but at least for now, can I just be honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself, really? Then week two, uh, as we spoke through it last week, we spoke into the legacy question, which is really just, What story do I want to tell? When this is nothing more than a story that I tell, what is the story that I want to tell? And that leads us into this week, being the third question that we should ask ourselves when wanting to make a decision. And the third question is the conscience question. This conscience question is, is there a tension that deserves my attention? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? Is there this internal tension fighting for attention in the moment? Is there this option that I'm considering that is that's causing attention? I mean, it's not like it's illegal. It's not like it's immoral, but for some reason, and I just can't put my finger on it. It's just not sitting well in me. There's just, there's just something that's bothering me. You know what I'm talking about. Growing up, my parents used to use this phrase where, where they would say, man, I've just got to check in my spirit. And if you grew up in a Christian home, chances are very good that you, know, you got the same answer which was super frustrating because what that really meant was no. Um, like you knew it's not going to happen and you weren't getting a reason for it either. <laughs> the reason was I have a check in my spirit. What were they saying? Man, 
I can't tell you why I'm saying no, but there's just something about this that bothers me. In our home today, my, my wife and I, we use a, a phrase that just says, if your peace leaves, leave with it. If your peace leaves, leave with it. In other words, there is a tension. There is something that's bothering me about this that is causing a lack of peace in my own conscience, in my own heart right now, that's leading me to a place where I'm just feeling no. No, I'd rather check out than commit to whatever this is. If your peace leaves, leave with it. Now I want to say this, whatever you call it, whatever phrase or statement or whatever it is that you run with in those moments, I believe the important part here is that when there's a tension, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Pay attention to it. If something's bothering you, let it bother you. If something's bothering you, let it bother you. Or sometimes we allow our, our wants, our desires to drive us to a point where we, where we almost, again, that, that inner salesman is demanding a quick and instant response from us. Why? Because, man, if you don't act now, you might miss it. You might not get it. It might be gone and you're just not going to get this opportunity again. So make a decision quick. Or sometimes our schedules demand for a quick answer no matter which it is if you are needing to make a decision in the moment and there is something that is gnawing at you some tension that is just sitting there that you can't quite explain don't ignore it pay attention to the tension whatever's bothering you let it bother you it might be that you've kind of been eyeing them out for a while and you feel like it's time to make a move and ask them out but if you're honest there's something inside that's just bothering you there's something inside that just doesn't quite feel right and you can't explain it because for all intents and purposes they seem perfect <laughs> but there's just something bothering you let it bother you Maybe there's a job opportunity that's come your way that just looks like the perfect job, something you've been waiting for forever, and all you have to do is pull the pin. But for some reason, it's really, really bothering you. You don't know what it is, but it's bothering you. Something just doesn't feel right. Let it bother you. Pay attention to the tension Maybe there's a business deal that you've been busy with for a while or longing for for a while and everything looks like this is that deal that could set you up for life. And everyone around you is screaming at you to take it, take it, take it because it's a no-brainer. But if you're honest, there's something that doesn't feel right. Pay attention to the tension. Let it bother you. Israel reached a point in their history where, where they desperately wanted a king. <laughs> so God, after a while, decided, let's give them a king. So he gave them Saul. And Saul, for all intents and purposes, seemed like the perfect guy. And then Saul reached a point where he really ended up being bad at the whole king gig uh, to the point where God told the prophet of the day Samuel to go to the house of a man by the name of Jesse and to go and anoint his youngest son just a little shepherd boy as king of Israel so Samuel did but Saul was still king and then David had that big moment in his life that whether you've been around church much or not, you probably know about it, uh, where David goes and, and kills Goliath, goes and kills this giant as probably a 15-year-old. And as David does this, 
his popularity with people starts to grow in all of Israel. And David starts to win over the hearts of the people, not really by trying, just by being David. And Saul is starting to lose the hearts of people and Saul's jealousy starts to grow towards David to the point where as David's exploits are getting bigger and bigger and the people's hearts are turning more and more towards David, Saul reaches a point where he figures the best option for him is to kill David. So Saul goes and gathers 3,000 men. Now, back in the day, that was a mammoth army. Saul gathers 3,000 men and he sets chase after David and David's little ragtag army. And David is prudent. He sees the danger coming and he takes the appropriate action. He runs. And as he runs, he goes and he, he hides in the, in the Yengedi desert. And he goes and he hides in some caves. And a day comes where, where he realizes that Saul's army's caught up with him. So he disperses his men into all these different caves so that if anyone got caught, they wouldn't all get caught together. Saul rolls in to this area, reaches the very cave where David and a few of his men are hiding. And in the moment, Saul receives the call of nature, gets off his, his horse, stops the whole army, climbs up into the cave where David and his men are hiding. And you can only imagine you're hiding from this guy. The next thing, he comes walking into the cave where you're hiding. He couldn't see them, turns his back to them. He lifts his robe squats down and he takes care of business and i can only imagine david and his man lying there and it's it's almost like a god ordained moment it's almost like man like god has just put their enemy on a silver platter and we know this because david's men say this to him they say now's your opportunity David's men whispered to him, Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. And it's like his men are saying to him, David, you know, if you don't kill the king, he's going to kill you. And God has ordained this moment. He's, he's put him right there for you. You have to take your shot. So David goes and he crawls up to where Saul is busy. And as he crawls up to Saul, he takes his knife from his sheath. And just before David is about to pounce and slit Saul's throat, There's this tension that rises up inside of him that he just can't ignore. <clears throat> and that tension is this. Man, I am about to kill the king. And in spite of the pressure of his men, in that moment, David pauses. David asks himself a couple of really good questions. And David doesn't act on what he was about to act on. You see, the truth be told, David didn't know what the outcome of killing Saul would be. I mean, David thought he knew. It seems pretty straightforward. Kill the king, you become the king. But he didn't know. Even though he thought he knew, he had no guarantee and ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to you and me, one of the reasons that we ignore the tension is because we think that we can predict the outcome. We can predict the future. But the truth be told, we have no guarantees. The truth be told, we don't really know. You see, 
If you feel like this isn't really true, just ask yourself this one question. Have you ever been disappointed? Why, why do we deal with disappointment? See, disappointment is just really the fact that we didn't get the outcome that we wanted. There's this build up. We, we, we're excited for something. We've made a couple of decisions that should lead to a certain place. And once we get there, it's completely different. And we don't get the outcome that we were looking for. And all of a sudden, we have this gross disappointment. See, it's ignoring the tension in the moment that sets us up for disappointment. Now, back to our story. Just a few feet away from Saul, it occurs to David that just because I kill the king, it doesn't mean I get to become the king. But one thing is for certain, if I kill the king, I will forever be the man who killed the king. That will be, as we spoke into last week, my legacy. That is the story that I will have to tell. That is the story that when my kids and my grandkids get together on a family occasion, that I will have to tell. And that's the story that they will tell about me. I'll have to sit with my grandkids one day and they'll be all excited. Hey, granddad, tell us about that time that you became king. Remember that time that you snuck up behind King Saul and while he was sitting on the toilet, you jumped up and slit his throat. Oh, granddad, you're so brave. Like, is that really the story that I want to tell? Is that the story that I want them to tell about me? You see, his conscience bothered him. For even considering to kill the king. And in that moment, David changes course right there and then. And here's what it says. It says that he ended up taking his knife, cutting off a piece of Saul's hem, and then crawling back to his men where they were freaking out because they felt like he just missed the perfect opportunity. But here's what he says to them. He says to them, The Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. So clearly they weren't over this. Like they still felt, if you're not going to do it, got no problem with my conscience. I can go and get this thing done. But David restrains them and stops them from killing Saul. And Saul finishes up, gets up, walks out the cave, goes and gets back on his horse. And can only imagine the picture as he gets back on his horse. Out of the mouth of the cave, Saul hears his name shouted. Saul! And as him and 3,000 men turn their heads to the mouth of the cave, out comes the silhouette of David. And he goes and he, it says that he fell to his knees and bowed before Saul, showing him respect. He stood up and he raised his hand. And what his men wished was the Saul, that was the head of Saul, was ultimately just a piece of his garment that David had cut off. And Saul shoots down, looks, and sees that there's a piece missing from his robe and realizes how close David had been to him. And every man present realizes that David was the better man. David goes and tells him a story like 
makes a speech. And at the end of his speech, this is what he says. He says, may the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me. But I will never harm you. He's saying, hey, regardless of the outcome, I recognize that I couldn't ignore the tension to own up to a responsibility that I was being given in the moment. And David decided wisely not to use Saul's bad behavior in order to do bad things. You see, in that moment, Saul was humiliated, not by David's power, not by David's wit, not by David's skill, but Saul was humiliated by David's humility. So Saul heads home. I wonder today, ladies and gentlemen, do you want to be the hero of your own story? Then maybe there's a tension that deserves your attention. You see, months later, while in the battle with the Philistines, Saul would, would catch a rogue arrow that would mortally wound him. And in fear of being caught by the Philistines, he ends up falling on his own sword and killing himself. News reaches the city and the people make David king. And I can only imagine that David must have thought to himself, man, if someone had just told me this months earlier, that decision would have been so much easier. But God created attention and David gave the correct attention to that tension. And we see an outcome, a result that does not lead to regret. And that's why you and I have to pay attention to the tension. That's why we dare not take matters into our own hands. That's why we do not trust our own ability to predict the future or to predict the outcome. No. That's why we must ask ourselves, is there attention that deserves my attention? Zion, my son, must have been about two or three years old. And him and my wife, Nats, went off to, to the um, grocery store, uh, did the groceries, paid, got to the car, and as Nats was loading Zion into the car, she realized that there was a chocolate in Zion's pocket. Understanding that he probably didn't know whether this was right or wrong, she explains the process to him, but now there's a tension. It's a couple of rand. No one's going to lose their job. I'm late. This is a frustration. I don't want to be running back in there now. I don't want to deal with this now. I've got stuff to do. But there was a tension that she had to pay attention to. She packs that up, goes into the spa, finds the manager, gives the chocolate back, and heads back to the car. Why? Because something bothered her. She let it bother her. And ultimately, doesn't live with this thing gnawing in the back of her mind. Silly little story. I realize that today you're in a position where you are, are at odds. You, you, you're wrestling with, with questions that range from taking a chocolate back to the spa and killing a king. And ultimately... The principle in any of those is the same. I wonder today, is there something in you? Something that you, you, you can't put your finger on? Or perhaps something that someone else has put their finger on, but it's, it's bothering you about a decision, an option that you need to choose from at this stage. I want to encourage you, pause and pay attention. You see, the truth is that 
that tension may very well be God's way of protecting you in the moment. It may be His way of steering you away from a decision that you'll regret later on. Each time you make a decision, especially a decision that takes you by surprise like David's decision took him by surprise, ask yourself, is there a tension that deserves my attention? Don't ignore it. Don't just get past it. Let it bother you until you know why it bothers you. I wonder today, what's your next step? What's your next step today? Do you need to ask yourself, hey, why is this bothering me? Should I hit pause and just take a moment and ask myself that question? What is the tension that is calling for my attention? Maybe today you need to choose, hey, I will pause even when I can't pinpoint why it's bothering me. But I will explore rather than ignore my conscience. I wonder today, ladies and gentlemen, is there a tension that deserves your attention? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for, again, just a great question for us to stop and ask ourselves in those really tricky moments, Lord. A moment that we all have often, where there's just something that bothers us in the moment where it may seem clear to everyone around us. Lord, I thank you that we will ask ourselves the question, that we will have the, the courage to answer it honestly. And Lord, that you give us the courage to act on it right there in the moment, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your desire for us is not to love with regret, Lord, but to love with peace of mind, peace of heart, and to love in a freedom that you offer us, Lord. As we just pay attention to the tension and let you point out to us why there was a tension in the first place. We love you. We commit these moments to you. And we thank you that we can entrust these moments to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us again today. We so look forward to meeting up with you again next week. We trust you have a great week.